Gévaudan is in the center of France, the land where the Lozère, Cantal, and Haute-Loire cross. This land seems to shelter in the depths of its forests all the mysterious beasts that can appear where man and wild nature meet. Oh, it crossed over there, just after the road. It was big, relatively big, and long. Do you have any idea of its size? Oh, its size. 70 or 80 centimeters tall, but very long. It was a very slender animal. Its tail was arched, like that, cylindrical. Its color was fawn, slightly white underneath. Its ears were pointed. Yes. It wasn't moving very fast. It jumped, came out from under the barbed wire over there, stopped at the edge of the road, jumped again from the edge... To the middle. To the middle. And after the third jump, it was in the ditch or on the slope. Firstly, Firstly, there's the size, 70 to 80 centimeters tall, and the speed, three jumps to cross the width of a road. Then there's the description, the cylindrical tail, the pointed ears, the fawn color with a white underside. For Bruno, the sighting leaves no room for confusion. But how, how is such a thing possible? How can this animal, which normally lives 8,000 kilometers from there, on the other side of the Atlantic, cross the path of a man at the bend of a road in the mountains at the center of France? But this isn't the first time for Gévaudin. 250 years ago, a beast was told of, leaving a bloody trace in the history of this territory. The wolf was accused, men were suspected, and even the idea of an exotic species was put forward. Is history repeating itself? Is it possible nowadays in the forests of Gévaudin, beside a path, to meet a puma? Everything here is fertile ground for legend. Mist frequently hides the landscape, and the harsh climate encourages the idea of wilderness. Since he loves stories about man and the wild, and especially because it's about a puma, this story has attracted Bruno's attention. He knows the puma. He encountered it several times when photographing wildlife in Costa Rica. By setting up in the heart of Gévaudin, can he once again manage to look one in the eyes? The puma is the big cat of America. There, it's also called a cougar. From Canada to Tierra del Fuego, it has conquered every ecosystem, forest, jungle, desert or mountain. It's a lithe, rapid, silent and powerful predator. Its size and weight make it a great predator at the top of the food chain. But its discretion has led to it being nicknamed the Invisible One, or Phantom. The Guayami Indians of Costa Rica have a proverb about this. Don't try to see the puma, it's the puma who lets you see him. A puma in a territory of 90,000 hectares the chances of meeting the animal seem almost non-existent. But even the most discreet of animals leaves traces, so Bruno explores all the stories told by the trails he has shown. Hey, there it is, you see, look, it's there, can you see it? There, there. This time, it's a wolf's tracks.
Bruno also sets up cameras to increase the chances of getting proof of the presence of a puma. At the same time, he also collects a glimpse of the beauty of ordinary nature. And finally, through perseverance. It was here a year and a half ago. There. Below. A nice feline print. Round, about 11 and a half centimetres, maximum 12 centimetres. No claw. A pad at the back which looked like an M, a big M. Almond shaped digits. And in fact, we sent it to several experts specialized in felines. It was well and truly a puma. We're a long way from its territory. Across the Atlantic, it's a long way. It is Roland Albinek from the Research Institute for Development in the Tropics who identified the print, giving form to Bruno's intuitions. Because even if it seems extraordinary, this is a plausible story. In Gévaudin, there is enough space for a puma to go unnoticed. There are enough deer to feed a horde of predators, and the climate is like that of North America, one of the natural ecosystems of the puma. But especially, this is a plausible story because of mankind's madness. A few thousand euros, a few clicks, and you can own a big cat. In the US, there are more tigers owned by private citizens than remain in the wild in India. So this situation could happen, and already has. After Koipu, Florida turtles, grey squirrels, will the puma become the next exotic species to establish itself in France? It's enough to forget to close its cage, and then the action of man becomes an irreversible act against nature. The domesticated animal becomes wild again. We heard these noises, yeah, and the dog was rooted to the spot, yeah, and then she went directly towards the noise, the cry, and then she went about 100 meters, and then came back. But what was strange was that when the dog came back, really frightened, we saw the horses forming a group with the stallion, I can remember, which was going around. Was that the first time you'd seen the dog in that state? Yes, that was the first time. Yes, my dog follows me. I work in the woods, and she follows me all the time. I know when there's game about, when it's there. I recognize her behavior, but I'd never seen her act like that. So, Franck, I'm going to get you to listen to a sound, and you tell me if that corresponds. Is that the animal? Oh, yes, that's it. So I was more or less at the start of the bend. Huh? And I was looking at the house, and in the headlights I saw, under the window, a long shape which was looking up at the window. And then it stood up. OK. The head turned towards me, a massive head. Yes. And I saw two magnificent eyes big and blue, a very deep blue. It got up and all I saw was a dark shape pass before my car. It was longer than the car is wide, at an amazing speed. Did you work out how fast? Oh, yes, yes, because this was quite something. I wanted to be sure. First, I tried several times with my car to see how fast I was going when I entered the bend. OK. I did 10 tests, and then I could say that I was travelling at an average of 35 kilometres an hour. So, from its starting position, up to when it passed my car, yes. it covered twice the distance I had myself. Do you see what I mean? OK. That makes around 70 kilometres an hour. When a friend came to see us and said, you've got a dead horse, I went and found Nuage lying there. I've never seen such butchery. I was really surprised. The head was really damaged, there was an ear missing, the eyes were gone, the cheek as well. 
Well, look, I'd like you to listen to this recording made in the US. Do you recognize the sound? No doubt. It's difficult not to find such testimony worrying. In five years, Bruno has spent thousands of hours outdoors looking for proof. Helped by the inhabitants, wildlife managers, foresters and hunters, he has found more than 20 witnesses and several prints which are unusual by their shape and their size. I heard the animal call seven times. About a metre fifty long, 80 centimetres tall. We could see it looking with big eyes like agate stones. And I said to myself, that looks like a puma. He is trying to determine habits by comparing witness accounts and traces in the hope of catching the phantom. But none of these elements is irrefutable proof. Ask a policeman and he will say that a witness is the least reliable element of a case and to be able to read prints correctly requires a perfect knowledge of the animal, its weight, its height and its movements. Such a degree of knowledge is rare, especially here in France. It's now the fifth autumn of this story and the territory and its inhabitants have no more secrets for Bruno, all except one. After five years of searching, the puma is everywhere that Bruno goes. Impossible not to imagine it crouching behind every bush, every tree trunk. If Bruno is so interested by the animal, it is perhaps because this story is really about us and about our relationship with the wild. The wild that we regulate and manage for hunting. The wild into which we introduce elements to limit that which escapes us. The wild which disturbs us and competes with us or frightens us. But what remains of the wild in our landscapes? The forests were planted when the shepherds deserted their pastures the deer and hybrid wild boars were introduced. We try to eradicate the predators. We control so as to try to fashion nature. Nature adapts, it dodges. Each time, each time a cage is opened, the control which is so dear to us is lost. So to compensate, we try to know, to understand how, why, and since when. But no matter how hard we try to shine a light into the shadows, put on binoculars to see better, give ourselves better ears to hear better. Perhaps the most important discovery we can make is that we are ourselves a part of that wild that we flee or seek. If wolves are present in France, it is simply because they have taken up the place that has been left to them. Is it the same for the puma? This year, winter is early. To give himself a second wind, Bruno decides to go and look for help where it can be found. There where it can be found. In Canada, the presence of the puma isn't an anomaly caused by man, it's an indispensable link of the ecosystem. 
There, it's the great predator. In Quebec, there is a scientist who has developed a system which should considerably increase the chances of seeing a puma. Hello, Bruno. Hello, Mark. Nice to meet you. Yes, me too. So this is it. This is where we've set up a cougar tracking station. Great, fantastic. Go on then, I'll follow. This is a research project which started at the beginning of the 2000s to detect the presence of cougars in Quebec. Rather than running after the cougars, we tried to bring them to us. This looks like a good spot here. The ground seems soft enough. Yes. So we can plant the stake. We drop the tube on the stake. So what's the tube for? It's perforated. Yes. Inside it, we've placed an olfactory bait. And in fact, this bait is made up of feline pheromones. Let's see, what does it smell like? Oh man, that stinks of perfume. It's a perfume base. Yes, but not a high-class perfume, rather cheap perfume. It's cougar perfume. <laughs> So all we do is hang this inside. OK. The steak and the odour diffuses into the environment. Since this is the spot where the odour is most concentrated, this is where the cougar will come to rub itself. OK. On the steak. For Bruno, this olfactory lure offers new hope of catching the phantom. No more running after it. It will come and rub against the cameras. But the lure is expensive. Several thousand dollars for a bottle, and that's just enough to make 10 baits. To have all the chances on his side, their sighting has to be carefully chosen. To do that, he needs to understand perfectly pumas and their movements. He needs to be able to follow them closely. So Bruno leaves Quebec to go to West Canada. Now it's his turn to fit in with his environment. While the puma is completely capable of adapting to the French climate, the same thing isn't easy for Bruno. At minus 20 degrees in the Canadian winter, each trip out means he has to dig into his resources. I'll put it in colour at the house, in the warm. The next stage takes him to Hinton, a little town in Alberta in the centre of Canada, to meet Samantha and Megan. These are two scientists specialised in the study of pumas. For their research, they track, capture and equip pumas with GPS collars. The data they collect allows them to follow the pumas closely and understand all of their habits. Hello. Hi. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice yeah. to meet you too. Are you ready to track some cougars? I think so. Okay. 
Let's pack up. Samantha and Megan have developed software which allows them to localize where the rest of the prey of pumas can be found. Knowing that an animal returns several nights in a row to eat the same carcass, Bruno intends placing a camera there. With a little luck, he'll get pictures of the feline. So we're just running the algorithm to see where the kill site is. We have a searching window for all of the points of where the cougar has been, which comes mm -hmm. from the GPS collar. So if more than two points are within 200 meters of each other within mm -hmm. six days, then it'll log it as a cluster. Mm -hmm. And then it'll introduce the rest of the other points to it to strengthen the cluster. Okay. And it outputs a centroid. Okay. And that's where we go and visit. All right, so the cougar that we're going to go visit the kill site of today is Luna, and she was a female that we collared last okay. week. Okay. The remains of a puma's meals are characteristic, for when it captures prey, the feline completely removes the hair before devouring it. Finding this kind of thing in the forests of Gévaudin would be irrefutable proof. However, without a GPS collar or an algorithm, it's not really the same story. All right, it's pretty close. Uh, we just have to be careful when we're walking around this area uh -huh. in case there's any scavengers around or other carnivores. Uh, we should probably also split up and everyone just look for hair and bones, any types of remains. OK? OK. I'll go this way. I have a bunch of hair here, too. I found it. It's over here. Okay, cool. Oh, look. Looks like a deer. Yeah, looks like a hair pile. OK. Should we grab some samples? Samantha and Megan get to work, while Bruno sets up a camera. That's not bad there. I should be able to film a puma with that. Unfortunately, the animal doesn't come back to finish the rest. It isn't that important, because the nights here can have other surprises which can warm your heart despite it being minus 30 degrees on the thermometer. The beauty of the aurora can make you stay up much of the night, which isn't especially a good idea, given the next day's program. Today we're going to try and catch some cougars. Uh, so we're going to drive down this hall road that we meet up with Lauren. He's checking out a track that we looked at yesterday and thought might be a cougar, but we weren't sure if it was a lynx or not. Um, so he's going to let us know. Oh, wow, look at that sunrise. Nice. Yeah. To capture an animal, Samantha and Megan call on the knowledge of Lorne. This professional tracker has specially trained his dogs for puma hunting. He has been helping scientific teams in their research for more than 40 years. To start with, a sufficiently fresh trail has to be found to set the dogs onto. Um, so Lauren thinks that he's, he found the track of our cougar from yesterday, crossing one of the roads, um, but I don't know how fresh it is. 
so we might have a chance. Quite confusing because there's a fresh link and the cougar are kind of right together, and I'm not sure what I've got up here, whether whether the lynx is walking on top of the cougar, I'm not too sure yet. Are there some up here that have a really solid um, back pad? Yeah, for sure. So she's talking about the back pad on the pant paw, so like the heel of the paw. When you can see it pushed into the no, yeah. then we know it's a heavier animal and we think it's a cougar. When you can't see that back paw, then yeah. we think maybe it's a lynx because uh, they're lighter mm -hmm. on the snow. Snow is a major advantage for tracking the animals as it gives precious clues. By studying the traces left by a puma, Lorne can tell whether it's male or female and estimate its weight. After three hours spent covering all the roads of the zone, it seems that the team finally have a firm trail. Yeah, this is definitely a female truck here. And uh, like a 90, 90 pound max probably. Okay, I'm just gonna hop out and look because there's a good one here that I think I might be able to measure and compare to yesterday. Yeah, so that one, there's a little bit of snow in it, but you can still get a good measurement. Yeah, it's about 50 millimeters. And I would imagine it's about the same size that we had yesterday. So it's likely the same cougar. Now a decision has to be made. The tracks aren't that fresh, and the direction taken by the puma is a little uncertain. But the temperature is up, and the snow is melting. In a few hours, perhaps there'll be nothing left to follow. So Lorne frees the dogs, hoping they can catch up with the puma. The feline is a sprinter, and the dog is a marathon runner. Hearing the pack get closer, the puma will try to put distance between itself and the danger to lose the pursuit. If the dogs hang on, the puma will take refuge at the top of a tree. That trained dogs can then, in theory, encircle so as to trap it. After an hour, it looks like the dogs have succeeded. Their GPS coordinates show that they've been in the same place for several minutes. Have they encircled the puma? So we're going to do one dart to for a 100 pound animal, 0.7. Okay, so I'll do the water. Megan and Samantha rapidly get the dose ready to send the animal to sleep. Then they hurry to catch the dogs. But once there, it's total confusion. No puma. The dogs are scattered, and their comings and goings have completely wiped out all the tracks from the zone. This trail seems lost. I can't find anything. After nine hours tracking, fatigue and disencouragement are starting to take their toll, and time is against the team. It's really warm, and what it means is the fresh snow that we got last night is melting and then plopping off onto the, into the snow on the ground, um, which means it can completely fill in the track and make it really hard for the dogs to follow. So I think they got held up here. They just couldn't continue to find the track. Um, but Lauren found the continuation of the cougar track just over here and set the dogs off on it. So it, it really depends if they're going to be able to follow it or not. Well, I, right now, it's almost closer to walk in from the road. Yep. So you think we should make our way back out? Yeah, this is a jungle to walk through. Yeah, I'm coming your way. Okay, see you in a second. Awesome. We've left 
the dogs continue on the track and our houndsman Lauren thinks that they might have something but the sun goes down in an hour so we only really have an hour all right it just jumped so we'll have to wait for it to tree again you guys will just have to follow follow um, the GPS He did see a cat, so we have a cougar. He has a cougar. Okay, hey, I'm not crazy, right? Dogs are over here. Somewhere. Is she still in the tree? Still in the tree. It's only up about 10 feet. Awesome. Okay, Samantha's going to come through first. Now a real race against the clock begins. At any moment, the puma could jump and run away. After a day spent in the damp and cold, everything speeds up sharply. Gosh, they've got energy. They're scrambling. Don't shoot my dog. I know, I know. Go ahead. Good shot. Perfect. Perfect. In a last bound, the puma tries to escape before being overcome by the anesthetic. A new phase begins. Samantha and Megan can take samples and place the GPS collar but the situation is still extremely tense. Female. She might even have kittens. Yeah. Right. Okay, I think that's a good little dip right there. Sure. Wonderful. I think that's better. Okay, our oxygen's on. So the first thing that I do is we, like Samantha mentioned, I, I put oxygen on the cougar and we check the vitals and that's exactly like you would see in a surgery in a veterinary clinic. Feel it. Tell me when to start. Sit. There's almost this internal calm that rushes over you when you start to realize the, like the severity of the situation you're in, that you have an animal that you you did this too, that you put them asleep. So now it's your duty to make sure that they get through the procedure and then you set them free in a healthy condition. So we put a tag on the ear just so that people know that she's been, had drugs in her body. The GPS goes up top, this is the battery. Um, and we just make sure her airway is clear and then we're gonna give her her reversal. This is the most tricky moment. The puma will remain vulnerable for several more hours, but once it wakes up, it could be very dangerous. Hello. Uh, okay, we've given reversal. We'll just be waiting for signs of her waking up. Megan and Samantha stay for a while at a safe distance from the puma to be sure that it wakes up without any problem. Then they go back to their base camp, happy with the outcome of the day. For Bruno, the day's intensity makes him realize something. Even surrounded by professionals, even with the help of dogs, coming close to a puma is still an exploit, even though there are many here. What are his chances back in Jevodin? 
How can he manage to meet the feline hiding there? Here, the unusually warm temperatures of this end of November have beaten the capturing program. We are truly in the Anthropocene, a new era where everything, plants and animals, landscapes and climate, is affected by mankind. Between climate deregulation and the introduction of a new species, it's really just a question of scale. It's the same story, processes which are at present out of our control from the moment we trigger them. While waiting for the cold, which finally never comes, Bruno profits from the natural wealth of the Rocky Mountains. It has to be said that watching eagles, moose or wapiti is a pleasant way of waiting. It also lets him think about the advice given to him by Lorne, the tracker. We gotta learn never to give up because, well, the cougar sure won't give up. So before going back to Gévaudin to hunt the invisible, Bruno makes a detour to Lorne's ranch. If there's someone in Canada who can help him in his quest, it's definitely this tracker who has caught many pumas in his life. The cougar is, is very definite. It walks through the forest, makes a, it makes a lone track. Yeah. It's, it's very... Stable. It's unlike the dogs and the wolves, they run around all over through the uh -huh. forest. Cougar makes a single track. Um, so the confusion we have is with lynx. Yeah. A, a lynx can have similar looking pattern. Okay. The, the big difference between a cougar and a lynx uh -huh. is a cougar is it's gonna sink into the snow much heavier. Yeah. Um, and a lynx will quite often, they spread their paw out and they'll pr virtually walk on top. Okay. When I ask somebody to describe the track, yeah. I say, you, you have to show me a picture or you have to be able to measure a back pad. And it's roughly gonna be 48 to 52 millimeters. Walking the woods with Lorne means benefiting from his knowledge, from all the experience acquired in a whole lifetime spent chasing pumas. It is also a unique opportunity for Bruno to offer the results of his five years of inquiry to a specialist. Lorne, I need some help, your help. What do you think about this picture? This is in the mud. Yeah. Mud, okay. Because they've maybe slid a little bit. Possible. Yeah. yeah. You got to maybe use your imagination, but I, I think I can see three lobes here. Yeah. It, it could be sliding. Yeah. Every one of these tracks could be a cougar track. I, I'm going to say I would have to see more yeah. to to say yes, but frankly, I don't know what else it could be. <laughs> it, it's, it's certainly, it certainly looks like a, a member of the cat family. Yeah. Mark said that it smelled of perfume. I don't share his opinion. Let's go. Bruno returns with Mark's product, Lawn's advice, and a good dose of optimism. Okay, now the plaster.
He goes back to his inquiry with the hope that one of the 14 olfactory lures that he has spread out over key spots in his territory will attract the puma to his cameras. One here, another here, and the last towards Le Puresh. There he is again, outside in the snow, with the strength of someone who knows he's nearing a conclusion. But things are never simple. Ho, ho, ho. Oh, hell. Oh, hell. This would happen. Instead of keeping his strength to place his lure, Bruno has to pull his car out of the ditch. The spot is chosen precisely. But to get there, Bruno often has to abandon his vehicle because the road is impassable. He must continue on foot, deep in the woods. Now he places all his hope in his lures. Years of inquiry have ended up with this conclusion. It certainly looks like a, a member of the cat family. Bruno hopes the Canadian method will give better results. He has invested so much time, energy, and expense in this search that he throws all of his strength into this new battle. One placed, only 13 to go. Bruno finishes his round at night, but success comes at that price. Lorne's expertise still leaves room for doubt. There is, in France, a member of the feline family, and their tracks look like puma tracks. Although specialists don't mention the presence of the lynx in Gévaudin, that does not necessarily mean there are none there. How long was the wolf in our forests before their presence was noticed? After all, animals know how to be discreet. Living in hiding is often a question of survival. For prey, so it escapes from the predator. For the predator, so that it doesn't become a target for eradication. The snow has melted, but the mist remains. 
Now it's the moment of truth. Blocked for a long time by winter, spring has freed the paths up once again. The lures have been in place for four months. Their perfume is certainly exhausted. The cameras are probably out of battery power. This is the moment for Bruno to collect the pictures, even if the weather isn't in his favor. Each one of the cameras is triggered by the slightest movement. If the bait has played its role, pictures of Puma should be recorded in their memory cards. Okay, let's take this series. Oh well, there you are. Last clip. 14 cameras, three hours to watch, and nothing like what I wanted. For 250 years, no one has managed to give a satisfactory explanation for the beast of Gévaudin. Up until now, it's the same for the story of the puma. But for Bruno, the game of hide-and-seek carries on. Unthinkable to talk of failure when the task is so difficult. When saying goodbye in Canada, Lorn said something a little like a prophecy. You know, it'll, it'll remain a mystery for a long time. He was able to read this story as well as he can read tracks. Maybe it's better this way. Some things should stay unanswered so that our world continues to have a magic side. <laughs>